Hello, I'm Alan Parsons and welcome to the Art and Science of Sound Recording on iTunes. This podcast contains two excerpts from the main program and also includes bonus footage from an interview I did with Taylor Hawkins from the Foo Fighters. You can get complete versions of the drums and EQ sections featured in this podcast at artandscienceofsound.com. Enjoy this podcast. An acoustic drum kit is an extremely complex piece of machinery. There are multiple components, a massive range of tone colors, a colossal dynamic range, and many different volumes that need balancing. There are resonances and rings, and lots of mechanical parts that can squeak or generate unwanted noises. Above all, it's driven in a very literal sense by raw human power. There's one thing you can be absolutely certain of hearing on just about every record between uh, when rock and roll started in the 50s and, and the present day, and that's drums. And we're very fortunate to have with us uh, a British drummer who has uh, worked with countless uh, British artists, American artists uh, in the studio and perhaps more notably with The Who uh, live and now with Toto, uh, Mr. Simon Phillips. The drum kit is made out of many parts, but to me, I always look at it as one instrument, like the piano. Because if I take these four toms away, this snare drum will sound different. I like to keep a very open sound. Whatever you're recording, the instrument has to sound great because you're, you're, you're starting on the right foot there. So acoustically, the, the instrument's got to be tuned right, it's got to sound right. And there are certain things that, over time, you get to know what a microphone likes. There was a time, was there not, when, when the bass drum was, uh, which became known as the kick drum in, in modern times, but yeah. the, the bass drum was almost unrecordable. It was, it was considered, you know, just a, a huge nuisance in the... Nuisance, uh, <laughs> loud and lots of sustain. In the 60s, we found out a way to really record a bass drum. Suddenly there was this much thicker sound, distortion, which we used to our advantage, but that old bass drum wasn't cutting through. And then, I don't know who first took the head off, but somebody did. I don't know who's responsible for that. But somebody figured out by taking that front head off, you could get rid of that, uh, that boom sustain and get a much more instant sound that was more recordable and more useful. Um, and that was even before I think anybody figured out about putting stuff in the bass drum. You know, so that, that, that was the... the, the Overcoats and... Uh, piano, piano covers, <laughs> yes, right. all sorts of newspapers. People used to tear up newspapers and put them in the bass drum. Yes. When, when, did the, when did the idea happen to, uh, put, to, holes put, a, in? to put a hole in the, in the front here? Ah, well, I think when drummers got tired of the look of a, of a bass drum, like mm -hmm. this, and also the rattling of all these, by the time you've taken all the tension rods out, these rattle like crazy, and rather putting, than putting tape on e each one of these, it's easier to just get a head and cut it out and put it back on. But the, the head itself is quite slack, is it? Or... Uh, no, actually my front head is actually quite tight, yes. Um, sometimes, especially live, if it's too loose, you get some feedback problems. It seems to work better a little tighter. Um, but, I, but we're still hearing the, mostly the, the sound of the, of, the, of the head being hit, right? Not, not, the, not the front head. Ah, you see, no, th th that's, that's why I use a true. front head. It really changes the, 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 the way the drum sounds. Basically what's happening right now is all of the air is coming straight out. So we've lost a lot of volume. We've lost a lot of low end. We've lost a lot of high end. It's a very mid-sounding mid thump at the moment, which for some music is great but it's very undynamic and personally I find it very hard to play and a little unmusical. Um, so what I do 
is there's another little technique is as well as the dampening there, I take a paint can. What that does, it's just mass. It, again, microphone friendly. It makes a very complex sound with a lot of low end floating around. It tightens up that low end and makes it easier for this boy to, to understand. By putting this on, what that does is it brings back a little more low end, definitely more high end, and more dynamics. The pitch and tone of a snare drum is influenced by the size and construction of the drum itself, as well as the tension of the heads. Okay, the snare drum is made up of, again, a very thin shell compared to the tom-toms. Two heads, one on the bottom, one on the top. The top is a regular, um, it's, it's, it's coated head, but it's a regular thickness. The bottom head is what we call a resonant head. It's very thin. Its only purpose is to make the snares vibrate. The, the better the snare drum, the faster the response of these snares. So I only have to touch it and see how those snares are all uh, speaking. One of the first guys that I worked with is this band's guy named Adam Casper. And he was really like a, a really great engineer. And, and sort of a producer. I mean, a, a producer, but Dave was really heavy-handed in that producing. So, um, and that was fine. And then the next guy, but it, I was really, you know, nervous first time in the studio. I mean, you first time you go in the studio, it's like, oh my God, this is, this is gonna be harder than I thought it was gonna be, you know? Um, learning to play with click tracks and things like that. I'd never really done that before. And, um, and the second guy we had was a guy named Nick Raskalinix who did our who, uh, the second guy that I worked on albums with, on Foo Fighters albums with, and um, he did two albums with us, One by One and In Your Honor. And he's great, because he's a real cheerleader. You know, he, he, he likes the way I play drums. I play drums on other projects for him, actually, sessioned drums for him uh, once or twice. And he's like a, you know, he's a fan of my drumming, and we love the same, you know, we can speak the same language because we grew up like in the same things, you know, so he can go do like that Neil Peart <laughs> lick right there, you know, that one on that album, you know, try and do something like that or whatever. We can speak in those terms and he'll be out there like in the glass, just like going like this, <laughs> you know, while you're doing it and just totally amping you out and getting you really hot, hot, hyped. And I think that's a great, thing for, you know, I've, this is for up and coming producers and stuff like that. You know, you hear a lot of horror stories, oh, let's try it again, try it again, well, we're gonna need a session drummer, all that kind of thing, you know, and for one thing, you know, if it's a band, for better or for worse, that's how their drummer sounds, you know, and the best thing I think that a producer can do, if I was a producer, would be like, especially if it's a band and it's not a, a solo project or, or, a, or, a, or an artist, you know, where you want to get it quick and get the, the, the radio sound or whatever. You know, the best thing you can do is really try and get these people happy about what they're doing and make them feel good because I've noticed that the better you feel, and you're a musician, you know, the better you feel out there with those headphones on with what they're saying to you in the glass, behind the glass, the better you'll play. What about the actual sound in the ears? The sound? Um, I mean, when you're wearing headphones. Oh, loud as hell. And we, you know, I use a lot of click. We do clicks a lot. T uh, tell me about a, a, a typical Foo Fighters, you know, how, how a track starts. It starts, track starts, starts with a click track, does it? Or would you... mm, well, it generally starts with a demo idea. And a lot of times me and Dave, just me and Dave will come in and do a demo thing and I'll just be kind of like his drum machine, basically. So he'll sit there with a the guitar and, and, you know, play me this riff idea and he'll kind of suggest a certain sort of pattern or just suggest a pattern or just play me something and things have come out all sorts of different ways. It's come out as just me just jamming with him and oh that's really cool and, or I have this idea for this rhythm and this is how the riff goes and so we'll do a quick sort of shabby demo of it. Usually not to a click or anything, just a quick one like we'll do like five songs in one day or something and he won't usually won't put vocals on it. He waits to the last to, to really finalize his melodies and lyrics usually. 
I, usually when that track's done, basically. Rock and roll, good rock and roll to me has feel. And feel is not perfection. I mean, I don't know, you know, I'm not, I don't need to tell you this. You've been making great records for a long time, you know. One of the best records ever made, Dark Side of the Moon, so I don't need to tell you this. And, and y'all, though, though you probably went for his perfection when you made that record, it was still only human perfection. You know, Nick Mason is not a metronome. He's a feel. He's got feel. Mm -hmm. And if that stuff was on pro, is that, if that record, if Night at the Opera by Queen or, you know, whatever, those records, Abbey Road, whatever, Abbey Road, you were, sorry. I know this. Only, only, pressing, only pressing play and record. Yeah, <laughs> well, you know, you were there, man. <laughs> I wasn't. Uh, you know, if those records were made on Pro Tools, I don't think wouldn't sound the same, that's for sure. You know, I, I, you gotta move into the future, you know, I, and... Despite the fact you're recording analog, are you likely to spin stuff off in, into Pro Tools and fix it and put it back onto the tape? Or you're we really don't want to. We don't. really, really want to make a record that, that, you know, and this is somewhere in the future, because we we need to take a break for a while, and who knows when this will come out, so maybe we'll be working on an album when it does. <laughs> Drums are complex because they're a collection of related instruments that are normally recorded to feel like they operate as a whole. So even if you EQ the sound of each drum and cymbal individually, it's important that the components fit together naturally. Kick drum is where most engineers will start looking at the drums. Kick drums operate mainly in the 40 to 250 hertz area, although the attack of a kick drum you'll find up at around 1 to 3 kilohertz. Once you're sure that the instrument itself is the best it can be with respect to tuning, damping, heads, etc. Look at around 50 hertz to reinforce or back off its density and thickness. If you need more attack, you'll find that at around 1 kilohertz. If your kick drum is a little bit indistinct, try cutting around 200 hertz to 400 hertz. The heartbeat sound on Dark Side of the Moon, you may be interested to hear, is simply a heavily EQ'd kick drum used in conjunction with a noise gate. The attack was minimized by reduction of mids and highs, and the boom boom was achieved by increasing the low frequencies right down to 30 hertz. When recording the snare drum, it's very important to get the natural sound right acoustically with tuning and damping before you start applying EQ. Having said that, rock and pop recording techniques normally include a mic an inch or two away from the snare head. We'd soon go deaf if we made a habit of putting our ears in such a place. But one area you might often need to address is getting rid of ring on a snare without having to resort to heavy damping, which can destroy the overall sound of the drum. Okay, we've got, uh, we've got Raymond out there on a drum kit. So this, um, this snare is going to give us problems. Uh, one um, thing we could do is, um, is just apply a, a bit of tape on to the top and let, let, let's just hear it Ray if you would just with your hand over the, over the top we'll hear that the ring is considerably reduced by doing that so a bit of tape would have done the, the same job there but um, supposing this was on a, 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 an already made recording say a live recording um, it would have been a, a problem obviously to damp the drum after, <laughs> after it's been recorded so we're going to try and get rid of the ring on the snare um, assuming that we can only achieve that with EQ. Okay, Ray, if you'd just uh, keep hitting it and uh, I'm going to experiment with EQ back here. Okay, I'm, I'm guessing that that uh, ring is happening in the sort of uh, f six, seven hundred uh, hertz kind of range, so I'm going to uh, try and tune into it by increasing it, so in, in, a, in actual fact making it sound worse. There it is, it's right, right in there somewhere. And uh, now, that I've, now that I've made it just about as bad as I can, I then cut at that frequency, and it's made a huge difference, as you can hear, to the, to the amount of ring we're hearing. And uh, I'll just take it back to flat again. And there it is being released. Snare drums can inhabit quite a wide range of frequencies from 100 Hz right up to 10 kHz for the crack of a snare. If you need some more depth, try adding a little at 100 Hz. 
if you feel the sound's a little muddy, take out a little in the mid-range, around 350 to 750 hertz. For the snap or crack of the snare, you might want to add something anywhere between 7.5 kilohertz and 10 kilohertz. I nearly always end up adding quite a lot of top end to a snare drum. Err on the side of caution though, don't paint yourself into a corner this early in the recording process. Depending on what you're using, tom-toms can live in a frequency range from almost kick drum depth to beyond the snare drum highs. What you're looking for in a recorded tom-tom generally is definition and punch. Tom-tom fills are played as punctuation, so you want them to speak and be heard clearly. That said, I've often found it helpful to keep in mind the overall perspective of the toms and not focus too much on the individual sound of one drum. Cymbals are the drummer's only sustaining instruments, and their tone is crucially important because their sound lives on beyond microseconds. Cymbals would normally be captured by overhead mics placed two or three feet above the kit. You can mic cymbals individually, but it's not a very common practice these days. Remember that if you apply EQ to overhead mics, you're effectively EQing the whole kit. But by applying EQ at high frequencies only, say 8 to 12K, you can change the perceived balance between the cymbals and the rest of the kit. That said, cymbals should be trusted to speak for themselves and shouldn't need a lot of EQ. If you're recording either very old, dirty or somehow dull cymbals, you may need to brighten up a little. A lot of people call this giving them a little air. Try around 8 kilohertz to 10 kilohertz. Don't overdo this though, especially on recording, as overly or unnaturally bright cymbals will get very wearing on the ears and you won't be able to get them to sit in the track very well. 